Hello and welcome. My name is Sharon Rose. I am the chair of the linguistics department. Welcome to our panel discussion. Yesterday, Wink's, perf Wink's performance was awesome. It was so funny. It was so entertaining and emotional. I cried. I'm going to talk now. <laughs> OK. So on the stage with me are two other members of the linguistics department, Dr. Peggy Lott, our ASL language program coordinator, and Tori Sampson, who is a first year PhD student who is conducting research on ASL. So tonight, our deaf culture event features a panel discussion with four local deaf community members who will discuss and share their experiences, moderated by Wink. We would like to thank our sponsors, the Division of Social Sciences, the Department of Anthropology, the Department of Communication, the Office for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and the Graduate Student Association. So the linguistics department has a long history of research on sign language, um, especially ASL, dating back to the pioneering work of Professor Ed Klima and Dr. Ursula Belugi at the Salk Institute. The first PhD dissertation on sign language in the department was in 1976 by Nancy Frischberg. Uh, she wrote about the historical development of signs in ASL. And the most recent dissertation was by Hope Morgan in 2017, who wrote about the phonology of Kenyan Sign Language. And in between, there have been 12 other dissertations on sign language, including those by leading researchers, including our own Carol Patton. And since 2008, Professor Rachel Mayberry has been heading the Multimodal Language Development Lab, which studies the acquisition and the neural processing of sign language. There have been four recent dissertations on sign language in linguistics since her arrival, and there are currently five PhD students, who I think are all here tonight, um, including Tori, working on sign language. In addition, the lab includes a lab manager, Marla Hattrack, three postdocs, and a number of undergrad students who work as research assistants. All of this research has made significant contributions to two important messages. Sign languages are rich, complex linguistic systems, and all deaf children should be exposed to sign language as early as possible. But research is not the only way we're involved with sign language in the department. We offer four linguistics classes with a focus on ASL and deaf culture, and five levels of ASL language classes. So I now turn the floor over to Peggy, um, who teaches two of our ASL-focused linguistics courses in ASL, and is also responsible for coordinating our ASL language program. Thank you, Sharon. Wait, I want to make sure you can see me. OK. Hello, everybody. Hello. I am a hearing person. I am from a hearing family. I, and I grew up here in San Diego. But I was lucky enough as a child to meet a deaf woman. I was fascinated by sign language. I wanted to learn her language. But I was in elementary school, and they didn't offer ASL. Hmm. So I thought, OK, I'll wait. I can be patient. So as I entered middle school, I thought, well, of course there'll be language classes. But my middle school didn't offer ASL either. So I thought, OK, I'll just study Spanish for three years while I'm here, which I really enjoyed. I enjoyed learning Spanish. And I thought, OK, if I just keep waiting for high school, they'll definitely have ASL as a class there, right? But yet again, I was frustrated because my high school did not offer ASL as a course. So I studied Latin for two years. Learned a lot. Learned a lot. But it's not even a living language. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I'm thinking, where are they teaching ASL? Well, I was making my way to college eventually, where I ended up here at UC San Diego. And I thought, of course, they'll offer ASL here, right? But guess what? Back then, they didn't. They did not have any ASL courses. But I'm glad to say that is an old story. Now, of course, we offer ASL classes, obviously, on campus. 
We have about 250 to 300 students every year, undergraduate students in ASL courses. And in America, uh, between 100 and 200,000 college students are enrolled in ASL courses every year. And that's a huge number. And I bet there are some in the audience who have already taken some ASL classes, am I right? Please stand if you've taken an ASL course. All right. More people signing changes the world. The world is a better place, right? And our ASL program here on campus was established 25 years ago. We have five levels of ASL. We're growing. We have several linguistic courses that we offer now for American Sign Language. We have ASL poetry, sociolinguistics of the deaf community, psycholinguistics of sign language, and a lot more. You can now minor in the study of ASL. There's also nine amazing deaf teachers here. They make it very fun and interesting to learn. And how I know that is that students tell me that time and time again, that their favorite class is ASL, which I get. It was my favorite class, too. <laughs> oh, wait, I never took a class. But if I could, I, I would have been my favorite class. And we also have a great ASL club on campus that stu is student-led, and they have events and activities and meet the deaf community. It's a great club. Is our ASL club here tonight? Anybody here tonight for the ASL club? All right. And as Sharon, in, in her introduction, mentioned, the linguistics program has these star graduate students. I'd like to introduce one of them, our new cohort this year, new student, Tori Sampson. Thank you, Peggy. So today, first of all, I want to take the opportunity to thank a particularly special group of people. And the reason I need to do that is that the this, this study of ASL wouldn't be possible without them. And that would be, of course, be deaf people in the signing community. I thank the proud bearers of ASL, whether they be deaf or hearing, native signers, non-native signers, well, they have a family member who's deaf, a parent, a sibling, a child who's deaf, and of course, those of us who are lucky enough to join the community. So again, a, a big thank you to all of you. Of course, the, the main theme of this event we don't want to forget is the partnership with ASL and deaf culture. It's so vital to all members of the deaf community, that connection between language and culture. And we're more than happy to share that with everybody in the audience tonight. So tonight will be a discussion, an analysis of deaf culture, what it's contributed to the world. And hopefully at the end of the discussion, that message is spread. So anybody who doesn't know about ASL or deaf community, it's, it's a great opportunity to introduce them to this dynamic world. And now I'd like to introduce Wink, who was our performer last night, and tonight will act as our moderator for the panel. Wink is hearing. He is a coda, a child of a deaf adult. When he's not busy performing or giving workshops, he runs a company called Wink Shop. And that company aims to give back to the community in several ways. It supports domestic violence outreach organization. It also develops a, a program called your Story, Our Hands, and that is where children come up with story ideas that performers then bring to life. They also provide volunteers for ASL, ASL Museum tour guides, both in spoken English and in sign language. And so if you're wondering, you want more information about Wink, please go to his website. It's www.winkasl.com, and he's also on YouTube at Wink ASL. Wink brought his own personal interpreter, Kiva, tonight. So Kiva and Wink are also linguistics PH students, PhD students at Gallaudet, which is such a cool connection. I'm so glad that they were able to come here for, for these two evenings. 
So Wink, I'll, I'll let you explain it about the format and uh, introducing the panelists. Everybody ready? Let's welcome Wink. Thank you so much for the introductions, everyone. Hello, nice to see everyone again tonight. And yes, as Tori said, I am a coda, I am hearing. My parents are both deaf. And you know, they taught me their language. I've always appreciated that I was able to get this language from them. Now, I do have to be clear, my father was an absolutely militant ASL teacher, right? So like if I did something from C, if you're familiar with that system, signing exact English, that's something you've heard of. So basically it's just, it was developed to try to make sign language look like English, which didn't really make any sense. My dad hated it, that's the point. So if I did anything from that system, ooh, good luck to me. I mean, I, oof, <laughs> it was bad, it was bad. So my dad, so if I did a sign like, like the sign for red, regular sign in ASL looks like this. Now if a C sign looks like this, little cross fingers, so it's an R on the chin. So for me, I was like, I do that, right? It'd be like red, and my dad, <laughs> I was like, sorry, nope, that won't happen again. And he said, not in my house. We're not doing row, row, red. Just red. <laughs> Got it? I was like, yep, sorry. But I mean, that kind of criticism, that kind of being told when I was wrong, that's how I learned the language. And also, you know, I had to interpret for my parents all the time. So if the phone was ringing and Obviously, somebody had to answer it. That was my job. I'd go answer the phone and I'd say, hello, thank you for calling Mother Father Deaf Video Relay Service. <laughs> this is interpreter number 002. <laughs> I have an older sister. She got one, so <laughs> whatever. Who are you calling? Uh, one moment, please. Dad, dad, phone's for you. Yeah, yeah, it's for you. Come on. You are now connected. But you think that meant I liked interpreting all the time? Yeah, of course not. Like, I was, I was just a kid, like I'd be asleep sometimes. Like one time, fast asleep, my dad comes by, sees me there, goes and gets for one hand a pot, the other hand a pan. <laughs> he gets this close to my head. So I go flying out of bed. <laughs> what? <laughs> and he said, oh good, you're still hearing. <laughs> Since you're up, I got a couple phone calls I'd like you to make for me. But I remember that when my dad got his first video phone. Oh, it's the best day of his life. So he gets the video phone, sets it up, and he's gonna get connected to an interpreter, right? He can make all of his calls through an interpreter. He doesn't have to use me anymore. So he was super pumped about it. So my dad was, you know, normally a pretty chill kind of guy. You know, he'd come home from work and walk in, take off his hat, take off his coat, hug my mom, like a normal guy. The day he got his first video phone, oh man, he came barreling into the house. Knocked the door off its hinges. Came running in, we locked eyes. He shoved me out of the way. <laughs> Went and set up his new toy. He said, get over here, feast your eyes on my video phone. <laughs> oh. 
son, this means that from now on, I will be using an interpreter and making all my calls myself. Death can. Death power. <laughs> Watch. And yeah, he made a call and an interpreter came up on the screen. I'd never seen anything like it. It was amazing. So, you know, he made his calls through the interpreter. I mean, call after call after call. Everything went great. At the end of it, he gave the interpreter some love, and he disconnected. And he looked at me and said, you are fired. <laughs> Think I was going to let it go down like that? I had to come up with a way to get him back. So I went to the largest video relay company in town, and I said, hello, good afternoon, I would like a job. He said, what are you, like nine? <laughs> I said, well, I am a coda, and they welcomed me appropriately. <laughs> so I went in, found my cube, got my little headset going. I got my first call. I was like, wait a minute, who are you? No. And I hung up on him. And I got another call, and I, I basically just hung up on people for a while until I found what I was looking for. <laughs> and I said, hello, Dad. <laughs> Ro -ro red what? <laughs> so that story has so much to do with deaf culture. There's so many little bits of deaf culture that come up in there. Some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight are some of the themes that come up in that story. So let me kind of run you through how tonight's going to go. We're going to have a discussion as a panel, um, and we've been talking about kind of their, some of their experiences, things that they would like to see, um, and also talking to some of the other members of the community. And we'd also like to get um, some thoughts from you know, the hearing community and figure out how that'll fit in. So we, we've worked through some of this, the what, five of us, four of us, I can count. It's, it's five of us. So we talked through that. But we're also going to open it up to you guys. We'd like the audience to be able to participate in this conversation. So we're going to talk, and then we'll open it up for questions, uh, for comments. Um, and then af you know, after each section, we'll open it up to the audience. So you're more than welcome to um, ask your question in spoken English. We've got a microphone that can go around. Um, you can ask your question in ASL, and we have a certified deaf interpreter up here on the stage that will be copy signing for people in the audience. So you can either ask a question, or, and it has to be related to that topic, or you can just add a comment. You know, if you're deaf, for example, or hard of hearing, or if you just want to throw something out there, give your perspective, we'd love to have that. Keeping in mind that those comments would be maxed out at, call it two, three minutes. We don't want you going on telling your life story. We'll, you know, knock you out, we'll kick you out of the room and we can talk about it in the bar later. But we're going to do two, three minute comments, max. Um, and then, you know, questions, comments, however you'd like to contribute. And then we'll go back to having our conversation up here. Does that sound doable? I will have to probably remind people of that as we go, and that's fine. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and welcome the panel. Everybody wants to come on up. We can get started. Great. I'm so excited to have everyone here. I've been spending some time talking to all of them, and there's so many experiences, so many perspectives that they bring as a group and as individuals. So we'll just start with introductions. Um, everyone will give their name, their name sign, um, where they're from, and just kind of some kind of basic background. Maybe a two-minute introduction each. Um, and, you know, throughout the night, things will come up, and um, you know, you'll be able to expand a little bit more on that. Let's get a basic kind of starting ground here first. We'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. My name is Resident Mogus Rydal. I am deaf, deaf power. I'm also an instructor at CSU Long Beach. It's uh, a new ASLD, which is a ASL culture focused under the uh, ASL department there at CSULB. 
I'm also EDD. I'm an edu educational doctoral student at CSUN. So both are full-time positions. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Okay, next. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Claudia. Um, you can sign my name either this way or this way. It's really up to you. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm also involved with uh, ASL tours for museums that, that occur every month. They're monthly events. Uh, and I'm self-employed. I, I don't know if you guys know about Amazon. Deaf people don't like that sign. Uh, but for me, I think it's too cute. I like it. Look at it. Uh -huh. So I work at Amazon. Uh, and Wait, what is that sign? I don't even know that sign. It's Amazon. Oh. Amazon. Oh. Yeah, Amazon. <laughs> I see. I saw this sign. I haven't seen it with that, that uh, A I've shape. I've never seen it done like that. Oh, that's new to me. <laughs> well, anyways. Wait, does that mean that you've got, you've got two name signs? And now Amazon's got two name signs, too? <laughs> right, exactly. You can sign it this way or this All way. Right. It's up to you guys. Nice. <laughs> Uh, what else about me? Uh, I talked about that I work at Amazon. Um, my entire family is hearing, uh, except for my sister, who's uh, older and, and also deaf. Uh, my parents don't sign. Uh, they can gesture. Uh, for me and my sister, I would say, let's see, uh, she's 47 years old. I'm 39 years old. So for all those years, my parents have been gesturing with us. And... Uh, we learned ASL and everything. Uh, I learned ASL from my sister and, uh, you know, as a baby. So that's how I learned ASL. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Moises. Uh, I go by Moy for short. I'm a graduate student here. Uh, I'm studying bilingual education in the educa uh, Education Studies Department, and, and I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Good evening. My name is Carol Patton. I've been here at UC San Diego a long time. I came here in 1978 as a grad student uh, in the linguistics department, and then I stayed and became a faculty member in 1983. I became chair of my department, then I became associate dean, and now I am the dean of social sciences at UC San Diego. My parents are deaf, my grandparents are deaf, I have an older deaf brother, <coughs> so I grew up, I went to a, a deaf school until I was eight, and then I transferred to a, a school. We didn't call it mainstream there then. We called it going to a public school. Um, I was hard of hearing with hearing aids, so they sent me at the public school, and I had no interpreter until I became a college student. So I want to just kind of add on to that real quick. You mentioned um, not calling uh, the program mainstream at the time. You just called it, you know, a, a hearing school or a public school. Oh, so, so you went to a hearing school. Okay, so you called it a hearing school. So um, the idea of mainstream, I just want to throw this out there for those of you who maybe don't have that idea, you know, don't have a conception of what we mean by that. You think of like mainstream music or mainstream culture, but so you think of people coming together and all kind of being, you know, blended, that, that's sort of where it comes from. So then there's also a sign that shows um, mainstream with a single student as opposed to multiple students. Right, I think the multiple student one was first and then the single one. And uh, I think we see more and more students being isolated and that sign has evolved from that. Right, right. So just wondering why you feel like that that name change happened. You know, you called it a hearing school or a public school and then and then turning it into a mainstream as a label. Well, I think at that time, deaf students, it was assumed that deaf students went to a deaf school. My parents went to a deaf school. My older brother was at the, s at the school for the deaf. Uh, the my parents, my mother, my excuse me, my father went to the middle school for, th for, th for the deaf. My mother went to Kendall School in Washington, D.C. My brother went to uh, the Maryland School for the Deaf and then I went to Kendall. And uh, the thought was that since I was hard of hearing, it, that was really the time where it was the idea was starting that maybe deaf students should try to be in hearing schools. And it was quite a shock for me at that time. I, w I was eight. I was in third grade. And I think the word mainstream as even didn't appear in the vocabulary really until we you had that movement to have disabled ch children in the public school system. And I think that was probably more... 70s, 80s. Yeah, probably when Ideal came out. Right, in the 80s. So I, I was in school before then. So as the one uh, child who was who could speak, and again, I as I mentioned, I had no interpreters. Yeah, so that's something else. Um, so wait, so were, uh, you were all mainstream yep. in mainstream schools? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so good. So let's go with that. Um, so going into a mainstream school and not having an interpreter, so right, so you really, you know, probably had a hard time communicating. That was a bit disorienting for you, um, you know, before the Americans with Disabilities Act came in. And then once 
we talk, started talking about least, least restrictive environments, the LRE. You know, that's, that's how they define where you should be is in your least restrictive environment. So how do you feel, having been in a mainstream or a public or hearing school, um, how do you feel about that, that, that idea that it's least restrictive and with or without interpreter? Well, so my parents are hearing, and uh, uh, I have four uh, siblings. Uh, and my older uh, one sister is deaf. Um, and I always considered, you know, my life as normal. You know, I have an older deaf sister, so that's, that was normal for me. Um, I'd watch my sister sign and, and go through life that way. Uh, when I was in preschool, uh, I was in a deaf program. Uh, and then they put me into a, a mainstream school system right after preschool in kindergarten. And I was exposed to public school, to the hearing classroom. Uh, and they, they put me together with an interpreter. They told me, th this interpreter is for you. You need to follow what this interpreter says. And I, I'd watch him follow along with the interpreter. But, you know, I missed a lot. I missed a lot of the stuff that was going on because I was so dependent on, on having that interpreter. I would say my experience is pretty similar to Moy's. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. And th they had a very large oral program there. And I... W it also had a lot of other students with various disabilities on the same campus, and I just didn't really understand what was happening because I saw a lot of kids in wheelchairs who had physical disabilities or who were blind, and it felt so different to me. I didn't understand why we were on that in that school when the deaf students were all separated in one area. Um, and then when I went to a mainstream program for the first time, they, they actually said, we want to try it with you. And I thought, you want to try it with me? Hmm. And we had to, like, compete. Who, who wants, you know, we had to fill out applications. Who wants to go to the mainstream school? Who wants to go have school with hearing kids? Uh, you, you want a big school? Who wants to go to the big school? And I thought, oh, I want to go to the big school. I was six, six or seven. So I thought, you know, it seemed exciting. I want to get out of here. I want to see something different. I want something new. And it was uh, mainstream as, and I was the only student there. I felt like I was a sucker because I missed my deaf classroom, and I know I was the only deaf student on this campus. But I really did so well in that school at, at math, particularly. I, I was challenging. I was ex it, it was exciting. But I so missed being with other deaf students. So when I moved to California, it was a really a culture shock for me because the signing was so different. In St. Louis, they, they used the C method, the signing exact English. And here, when I moved here, it, there were so many people signing ASL in Southern California. It felt so different. And I felt like, here I am, out of the loop again. I want to reconnect with deaf people, and I feel like I'm constantly out of the loop. Um, so, yeah, I was the outcast in, in both worlds for a while. But I also have a deaf older brother. So my, I, my family, we did sign within our home. So I didn't feel disconnected in that, or language deprived particularly. Did you say your parents sign? Well, my dad somewhat, I should say. My mother signs. I think that's obviously why I have a better connection to my mother, of course. <laughs> but, I, you know, most of the time that happens with dads. I think that's a common pattern in families. So, yeah, that was my mainstream experience. I really, yeah, at the age of six or seven, started being mainstreamed, and it just felt like, yeah, it was a different universe. And it's, uh, Especially right now in this doctoral program that I'm in, I have deaf classmates, finally! I'm like, this is what people talk about. This is what it's like. I can talk to people. I didn't know what this was like. I thought that was a family thing. I didn't know it could happen in a classroom. So that's a definitely a new experience for me. So for me, I, I don't even really know how to start. Uh, my sister grew up uh, going to a, a public mainstream school in, in L.A. Uh, when we moved here, well, I was actually born in L.A., and then when we moved here, um, both of us went to the same uh, school, Lafayette School, and it, uh, my sister, you know, because she was signing, I, you know, learned uh, really not from the school, but more from my sister because she signed to me, and then I became proficient in ASL. And, you know, sometimes we added PSE or signed exact English because we had the influence from the school and the teachers, uh, and they tended to sign in, in signing exact English. Like, they'd say something like, I am going to the house. I am going... You know, and they'd write out, you know, all these uh, uh, 
grammatically English sentence. And you know, with my sister, I could use ASL. And then with my parents, I'd have to gesture like they'd sign this, which means so we're ready to go. So I have that gesture, I have that English, and I have that ASL. Uh, and that's who I am and who I became. So I'm able to flip through the three different worlds. If I have to gesture, if I have to use ASL, or if I have to use English or C, um, I can flip between all of those. It's what I'm used to. So that's what, you know, my school experience uh, was like that. I went to a, a hearing mainstream school. I think it was my, gosh, junior year. I decided, you know, I want to go to the school for the deaf in Riverside. Um, so I went. And holy cow. You know, I am culturally deaf. I have a deaf sister. I, you know, I know deaf culture. I am deaf culture. But when I went to that school, it was just, it was such a rich deaf environment. They were tough deaf people. They were proud deaf people. And everything, you know, I wasn't used to that. I was more independent. I was more free. I was more broad. I, you know, I wasn't the type of person to, like, you know, shame somebody for their beliefs. But, uh, you know, I, I learned on my own. But when I went to Riverside, holy cow. Six months, and I was like, forget about it. I, I moved back to the hearing school here, and now I'm a little bit older, and, you know, I thought, I think to myself, eh, I probably should have stayed there. You know, I would have learned a lot. I, I would have understood a lot more, but, uh, you know, that's what I think of as I get older. But I still, I continue to learn about the hearing and the deaf world and my culture, and I continue to learn. Uh, and my art, uh, you know, when I, when I think about my art, where I create my art, um, I think of it as, you know, part of sign language. Um, I create my art, and I incorporate uh, ASL into into my art. Wink, did you plan for all of us to have deaf siblings? Was that a requirement to be on the panel? No, no, actually I didn't. I don't know who picked all these, <laughs> these panelists, but good job. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. So it's something that I'd like to follow up with about that. So, um, you know, I've seen, like my mom was main, is in a mainstream school. My dad went to a deaf school, so they had different experiences there. Um, but I've noticed that a lot of deaf people will talk about how, um, you know, the, the interaction with their teachers, you know, what it was like to receive education. Um, but I'm also interested more about, like, your peers, how you interacted, if you felt like you were left out, or if you feel like you were, um, you know, able to have a peer group you know, in, a, in a hearing school, a mainstream school, or did you feel like because it was, you know, we were younger, you played, there was less need to have formal communication, or how that worked? I'm very interested in yours in particular, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I um, actually created an ASL poem about that. A short one, I promise, short. Would you, would you show us? Awesome. Wow. So, yeah, uh, that really encapsulates my... Yeah, would you mind kind of just running us through, like, how yes, you yes, yes. came up with that? Okay. So, that really was trying to show my experience, um, th that idea of being in that mainstream environment, that there's uh, the, the us and then them. You know, the idea of being, I, w I wish I was with them. I wish I was uh, could be with them. And, and the idea of not being satisfied with the education of the deaf program and wanting to be with the deaf students, but the deaf program is lacking and the teachers are lacking, and the, and the standards are lacking, and their expectations are low, and, and there, there, is, there is nothing stimulating about that environment educationally. So you're not getting your an education on par with your peers, but they're getting this amazing social interaction that I don't get. I'm staring in my mainstream classroom at one interpreter, missing out on all those social interactions. But then over there, I felt like I was missing out educationally, so that was just how to encapsulate all that. I feel like in my case it was a little bit different because my parents both taught at Gallaudet University. They both were graduates of Gallaudet University and went on to become professors. So I'm not a first-generation college student. Both of my parents are. And they are both uh, alumni of a university for deaf students. So they, I would often, as a child, go to the deaf school that's on Gallaudet's campus, Kendall and I'd be waiting for my parents to finish their class so that I could go home with them. So I had that feeling of that separation when I went to the public school. I think all of the 
typical, you know, I had there was a special a group of, of deaf students, but they were all different ages. They weren't all in the same class, but when we would do ev events, like we went to the Washington Symphony, and they brought deaf students to the symphony, but, <laughs> you know, it's a typical thing that happened. So a a as a field trip to the symphony, we I noticed th there was classmates from the deaf school sitting in the at the symphony, so I was so excited to see them, and that, that distance felt very real. And I realized that I was in a different group and in a different world and very distant from them in, in more ways than one. So I would, I would meet and run into deaf people at Gallaudet. Um, I, I was friends with students there. My, my parents had friends and that life on campus. So I definitely felt that it l almost like I was studying abroad. And then I would come home and have a social life and socialize. And then I'd have to leave and go back and study abroad to in the other world. Yeah, I can definitely relate uh, to your poem, uh, absolutely, and, and to your story. I, uh, <coughs> I was reinstreamed completely by myself my entire educational uh, career from kindergarten to high school. Uh, in college, I had my very first deaf classmate. And I remember being in elementary school, uh, and I'm in a mainstream classroom, and I'd raise my hand and, and voice or, or sign uh, my question, uh, and my interpreter would voice for me. And I remember the bell would ring, and I was out with my deaf friends. I needed that socialization because that's where I felt I belonged. You know, I could see their facial expressions. I could see their emotions. And sometimes they'd say, you know, why do you come hang, they'd say, why do you come hang out with us, mainstream boy? Like, you're, you're smarter than us. And, and to me, I felt like, ah, okay. But I still wanted to play with them. You know, they were still my friends. Um, and then sometimes, you know, I'd go and, and I'd hang out with my, my hearing peers. And I would voice, I would use my voice, uh, and they would make fun of me because, you know, I, I grew up doing speech therapy, but my voice isn't perfect. And I think that experience uh, throughout elementary school, middle school, high school, anytime, you know, I had the opportunity for a break from my classroom, I was just, I wanted to be with my deaf friends, socializing, signing. That's where I felt like I could be myself. I didn't have to, you know, pretend or, or put a cover on, put a veil over who I was. Um, I don't know if you guys have the same experience, but... Uh, when I see the class laughing, I would pretend to laugh too, but uh, the joke would come late, you know, because there's the lag time with the interpreter, right? But I, I would still laugh, you know. I don't, I don't even know what the joke was about, but um, that was an experience that I had growing up. Uh, do you mind asking the question again? Sure, yeah. No, I was just wondering about um, when you socialize with other kids um, growing up in a mainstream program, if you felt like you were close with them or if you, you know, what your experience was like with other students. Yeah, you yeah, mean the as a child? in a mainstream school, yeah, specifically. Mm. I never really socialized with the hearing kids when I was young. Uh, for myself, elementary school, I felt like I was already excellent at signing and, and facial expressions and stuff because of my sister. And if I, you know, if I was curious, I, I hung out with her, her friends and. Um, I learned to sign uh, so proficiently. I even learned like the dirty words and my sister would slap my hands and she's like, no, they understand you. They're deaf too. And I was like, ah, I, I didn't know. Sorry. I'd play <laughs> dumb, right? <laughs> One time I, uh, I caught, you know, some of the signs that my, my sister was signing and I didn't even know what they meant really. Uh, they were more like formal signs or something. And, and one girl, a student who was deaf, the two of us were kind of getting into a tiff with each other uh, and she was mad and she, she ran off and uh, the girl... She went up to the teacher and she said, oh, Claudia, she told me uh, not to be friends with me and not to play with me. And I was like, no, that's bullshit. <laughs> and the aide was like, oh, 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 oh. Um, and I was like, no, it's bullshit. It's bullshit. <laughs> and the teacher's aide was like, Ho hold on. Uh, and she said, I need to talk to you in private, Claudia. Uh, come over here. Yeah, I understand. Uh, maybe she misunderstood. Uh, maybe she's not telling the truth. But uh, Claudia, please don't use this sign. And I was like, but my sister told me that this means, no, uh, she was lying. I thought it meant she was lying. And the teacher's aide was like, no, it means, uh, it means it's a bad word. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Another thing, like, like I said before that we used to gesture, I don't know if you guys know Cabbage Patch Dolls, are you guys familiar with them? Uh, we didn't know the signs for them. We didn't have a sign for them or whatever. Nobody told us what the name of the doll was, the Cabbage Patch Doll. So instead, we signed it like this, <laughs> you know, because they had their cheeks, right? You know, we took the art on the box, and we're like, oh, that's what we'll call it. Uh, so my sister wanted to you know, tell a story. She wanted to tell a scary story. So she said, 
Claudia, you know at night if you're afraid you know, of monsters or something, what you got to do to the Cabbage Patch doll, uh, the Cabbage Patch doll will come uh, alive. And I was afraid. Like I used to think that my Cabbage Patch doll was going to come uh, alive. And so I went to school and I said to the teachers and my friends, and I'm like, do you guys have, and I did this sign, you know the doll's like this? And the kids are like, what the heck is that? We don't know what that is. And the teacher came up to me and she's like, what's wrong? And I was like, you know this, the, d- the devil. The <laughs> <laughs> and my teacher's like, what are you even signing about? The doll with the cheeks and the dimples and the, the hair. And she's like, oh, no, that's a, that's a Cabbage Patch doll. And I was like, I don't know, but it's devil. I know it's <laughs> the devil. And my teacher's like, who taught you that? I'm like, my sister told me that, seriously. And, like, as an adult, I grew up and I realized that I was so used to, like, being told those signs and stuff. And when I went into the hearing world, I didn't, you know, really know uh, uh, how to, to kind of be involved in the hearing world. But because I had such little communication with my parents, until I became much older, I was probably about, gosh, I was out in the real world at that time. And I, I got, you know, stuck. I was in the real world. I had to write back and forth. I had to, you know gesture, that type of thing, and it's still, it's still a struggle, you know. I feel like I have my ups and then my downs, and then my ups and then my downs. Uh, and I have much, many disagreements with hearing people, especially at work sometimes. Um, but that I'll share later about my job. <laughs> yeah, no, one thing that really, you know, strikes me about that is, you know, trying to say like, well, you know, that sign means lying, and you're told, no, that's a bad word. And, you know, so I remember... Um, you know, going through, you know, public school, for kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, and then I was pulled out and homeschooled. So my parents, I mean, that's, I was around my parents all the time, right? So I signed all the time. Um, and I had this one hearing friend. I used to have two, but, you know, downsize, economy, you know, so I just, <laughs> down to one. Was it a birthday gift? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's just like, ah, I got plenty of these hearing people. It's just, I don't need the one, you know, <laughs> ASL books. Anyway, no, but so, um, uh, you know, we'd, we'd hang out, me and this one hearing friend of mine, um, and there's this TV show, uh, and they were, you know, insulting each other, threatening each other, or whatever, and the, the characters. So we're watching this, and I didn't realize that a specific word in the sentence that they w- kept coming up was a bad word. And I'm like, oh, it's just a word I didn't know. And I thought that's like when you're playing, you know, and you're playing with your you know, action figures or whatever, and you can say that word. And his mom busted me. I'm like saying this word that I didn't know was bad. And she's like, no, you can't say that. That's terrible. You're a kid. And I'm like, I, I, I legit had didn't know that word. It just like had come up on TV. It was on a cartoon or some, or I, I don't know. So uh, he was embarrassed, and I was embarrassed, and I didn't understand. And, and I found out later, you know, because I, I had to ask what it even meant. Um, and my, I asked my mom, she's like, I, I, I don't know, but you should, you should know, and you shouldn't say that anymore. I'm, I'm not sure. And so, I mean, just that it was way later, years later, that I heard that word, and I figured out via context, oh, that was bad. <laughs> oh, I see why she was mad now. So, no, yeah, I, I totally feel you on that. Um, and so to see that kind of, you know, like missing information and, you know, that kind of, it's a theme. So you can sort of miss parts when you're, you're dealing with hearing people. So... I'm just kind of wondering, like, in terms of your classmates, you know, when you're seeing them and not really understanding why they do a particular thing or, you know, why something happens, um, and then you ask, you know, why do hearing people do this thing, that thing? Um, Do you feel like you were able to ask and, like, get good explanations? Like, why do hearing people do this? And then your parents told you or just, like, you'll figure it out when you're grown up? Or what was your experience with that? You know, if I'm looking at a hearing person, uh, I don't know what it's like to be a hearing person. I grew up deaf, and people have always focused on my, you know, my ears, the fact that I'm deaf, and then my parents would talk to me, and I used to copy my parents when they would speak Spanish. They'd go like this. I had no idea what they were saying. I, I, n- I don't know the words, but they were always like this. And my sister's like, uh, I'm not sure. So, you know, I'd copy my sister's facial expression. And I could, like, act like I was hearing. I, like, pretend like I was hearing to see if I can, like, do it the hearing way. And I was like, oh, I want to be included. I, I could pretend to be hearing. Okay. And I tried to, you know, I became super loud, louder and louder. And, lou- and my parents got just so tired of it. And they're like, stop. Claudia, stop doing that. Shh, calm down. And I was like, no, nah, I don't get it. And I realized as I was getting older and older, I was like, oh, I'm making these sounds. I had to admit, I still, you know, make garbled words, I, I, I still do it with my parents, you know, when I'm copying them. 
<laughs> I can say the da 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 and my parents, both of them, they still get me. They get me. I guess they're just kind of used to it, right? They're like, oh, she's deaf. She can make whatever sound she wants, <laughs> to be honest with you, yeah. Uh, regarding that question, hmm. Really growing up, it, when I was, you know, when I observe hearing people, I don't, know, I don't know if I know how to explain it. I always had the sense of that they don't really understand where I'm coming from. So I'd share with my parents my frustration, things that happened at school. Uh, my parents, they, they didn't have any education. They maxed out kindergarten. Uh, they lived in, in deep Mexico, and they, they moved here uh, to start a family. Um, so they always told me that, you know, people in the world won't understand what it's like to feel, uh, you know, reje rejected. Um, and we, we talk about the idea of inclusion. Uh, people don't know what it feels like for the uh, to be in the other person's shoes. So sometimes you'll face people out in the world, and you just have to do your best to, to navigate and to ignore kind of the people who are trying to oppress you. Uh, do your best to be you and, and uh, be the best person that you can be. Uh, that was what they shared with me. That's what they instilled in me. A and it got to the point where, you know, after I graduated college, um, I started doing some work um, in physical therapy and uh, for a couple years. And I had a lot of experiences where I felt like, you know, I'm missing a lot of things that are going on with work, with patients, you know, a lot of laughing going on in my environment, but I don't really know what's going on. And one day I just told my parents, look, I don't know if I can do this. Um, I'm deaf, and I I'm stuck in this hearing world. And my parents told me, uh, I don't know if you've heard the story about uh, the mule uh, who falls down the well, and the owner just leaves the mule down the well. But the mule is so stubborn, people come and they look and they throw things down the well at the mule and the mule figures out a way to walk on top of the garbage. And there's so much garbage to the point where he can walk out of the well. And to me, that's kind of what the experience has been like as a deaf person. I've seen frustration after frustration after frustration, but I've navigated through life. Uh, even though I can hear and I can talk a little bit, I still have that experience of frustration. Um, you know, and people on the other side, they don't know what it's like to be us. my experience in my family, we often talked about hearing people in our home. We had discussions about, you know, what to do, how we navigate things, how we solve problems or conflicts. My brother would share, my parents would discuss. It was a, it was a whole family environment. And m my role became a little bit different because my parents both were educated at a deaf school and then went to Gallaudet University and became professors at Gallaudet University. But my parents really didn't know what a, a public hearing school was like. So as a student at a public hearing school, my parents really didn't understand how the system worked, the structure, the, the principal, and, and the teachers, and the roles, and having more than one teacher, and the, the separation. Because usually at deaf schools, all the grades are in one place, you know, K through 12. And, and in public hearing schools, you have elementary school. What used to be junior high school is now middle school. And so I became the person who was explaining to my parents about the things I was exposed to. So there was an instance where we had a parent-teacher conference. And if, you, and if you remember, I was in school, this is the early 70s, and we're having a parent-teacher conference. So there was a note that I brought home, and it was for my parents, saying that they had an appointment at 4 o'clock, and they had to go sit and meet with the parents. And my, my parents asked me, what is this? What's a parent-teacher conference? And so I explained to my parents, well, you have to go meet with my teachers, and they're going to tell, tell you how I'm doing, if, you know, my behavior and all of that. And, of course, I had to interpret. I interpreted <laughs> I, my own parent-teacher <laughs> conference. Yep, me too. Me too. Right? Sure did. So I can't remember how truthful I was. But, you know, I was, you know, I, I can't remember. Oh, I think I, I was faithful. everything. But um, I, I found myself explaining to my parents what to do, you know, letting them know that when you arrive to the classroom, you need to ask my teacher. And so my, pa my parents were asking me how to navigate this experience that they'd never had before. So, and then I was also explaining to my teachers that, you know, my parents hadn't had this experience before. And so I feel like I'm still doing that today. The <laughs> same thing as the dean. I'm taking people who don't know something and bringing people who don't know something, putting them in the same room and getting them together. But <laughs> I guess that's where I got my skills.
but I did a lot of mediating as a child, H a lot of figuring out how does that, how do things work, and then explaining to my parents and exposing them to things that I was seeing, and and then often it opened a lot of family discussions, and then I would, you know, deepen my observations of what I was learning and coming back and discussing more because everybody was interested in hearing people in my family, so it was a lot of dinner conversations about that. Wow. In one of your books, you mention uh, what the about when growing up deaf and then realizing that there are hearing people, that interesting experience. I also come from a, a signing family, and I knew hearing people existed, <laughs> but I expected that my family would sign. You know, that was just an expectation yeah, as a child. And again, I made a poem about this, too, this experience, but I had an uncle who came to visit on my, my mother's side, uh, who was from Italy, and uh, we were at the airport, it was very exciting, and I wanted to meet my uncle, and I hadn't really, ha I, at, up to that point, I just had our, our connect, a close family, just the five of us. Everybody else was, was living in other countries, so this was a big event. I was getting to meet another family member that I'd never gotten to meet before, and they get in the airport, and I start signing, and they're s looking like a deer in headlights. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, uh, what's wrong with my uncle? I, and I said, are you stupid? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> my mom, ah! No, that's my brother. Don't talk to my. Oh, that's your uncle. And but I was thinking, well, why isn't he signing? What's wrong with him? Er, my family should sign. So that my mom was trying to. It's trying to explain. He's hearing. He's hearing. And I, I know, but he's my family. So to me, I didn't make the distinction between hearing people and my hearing family members, because my mom was hearing, and I said, I said, I told my mom several times, I do feel sorry for you that you're hearing. Because I really have, you know, I see that the, the deaf community, I value it. So I, don't, I have no self-pity, but I pity my mom for being hearing. But at the time, I was thinking, my uncle, he didn't know sign. I thought, oh, I'm going to have to teach him. Poor uncle. So that was the first time I realized that. Do you mind if I add to that? Uh, talking about family. Uh, so I mentioned my parents are hearing. Uh, my older sister is deaf. And then the rest of my family is hearing. So a lot of the times, you know, I'll go to Mexico to visit family. You know, at home I'm fine. I, I can speak Spanish pretty well with my parents. Uh, you know, my brother and, and my sister, we sign it or speak Spanish. I mean, we, the deaf community is small. and we're, we're a small group, so I can speak Spanish to them uh, with my family, that my immediate family here. But when I go to Mexico, everybody's speaking so fast, and I just I feel so isolated. And then I see my sister, and it feels so good because we can just sign with each other. And we keep each other company. Uh, till more and more recently, We've, uh, you know, for example, Thanksgiving dinner, uh, Christmas, uh, my family will talk with each other. And sometimes, you know, we wish that our family knew sign so the two of us could sign with each other. But at the same time, the two of us always felt like uh, it'd be nice to have access uh, to our family. Uh, you know, a lot of deaf people don't have access with their family. We're lucky we can speak Spanish and build a relationship with our parents. But a lot of deaf people, uh, a lot of my friends, they grow up and, and they just don't have a connection with their parents. Uh, sometimes I feel like the hearing world, I get a little sense of, uh, you know, I'm not angry at the hearing world. I don't want to say that because I can connect. But at the same time, I wish that the hearing world would understand how much, you know, we have to work and work and work to figure out what you're saying. Uh, how we have to, like, look around the classroom to figure out where someone else is talking. And, and our eyes dart back and forth through the classroom to figure out who's speaking. And I don't know if people can understand it, you know, until you're that person. Yeah, well that's really interesting. You know, so um, I think maybe now would be a good time to open it up to the audience, um, talk a little bit about um, school experiences or education. Um, you know, deaf people, if you'd like to share your stories. Um, remember keeping it under two to three minutes. Um, I got a timer here, I will use it. Um, no, but really, if anybody wants to share your story, your experience, you know, we're going to open the floor to anybody um, who has something to add or questions you'd like to ask. <laughs> so in my elementary school, I, we had a small uh, presentation where we signed a song in sign language. And I was wondering if you guys ever had that sort of experience where your school had a sign language thing just to like expand culture or something?
Uh, I did. Uh, at Lafayette School, it was uh, Christmas, I remember. My teacher was, he was a horrible man, to be honest with you. He was god-awful. <laughs> but anyway, he taught us, uh, he said that we all have to do Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So I had a young boy that sat next to me who was like Santa Claus, and he had like the reins, and he had all his reindeer in front of him, and I had this like thing on my head with like the horns, right? So my teacher said to the, to the boy, please continue uh, doing the reins. There was no music, or the music was already on, but we were all deaf, so we didn't know. It was so stupid. <laughs> so we were all like, or he was pretending like he had the reins and all that. And I think I was like in the middle somewhere, maybe the third or fourth reindeer. There were a couple more behind me, and then like the boy who was Santa Claus in the back, right? So my parents uh, and my sister, they came and they sat and they were going to watch us. As soon as I saw my dad uh, get up, he walked to the front. He wanted to take a picture. I turned and I was like, look, 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 that's my dad. That's my dad. That's my dad. Even though the song was already going, right? I'm like, hey, look, look. I wasn't following the teacher. I, I didn't care what he wanted. So my dad snaps the picture, right? And my sister's like, oh, God. <laughs> and my mom was just, uh, it was so embarrassing, right? And I was like, look, my dad, my dad, my dad. I was so excited to see him, right? That I couldn't con contain, it, contain myself. You know, my parents were showing are coming to watch me as, a, as an actress. So uh, that's something that kind of stuck with me. The, the music I didn't understand, I didn't care about, I didn't understand why we were doing this Christmas show. I mean, I guess it was fun, but there was really, they didn't tell us that the music was on. Later, the teacher pulled me aside and she was like, uh-uh-uh, the audience, you have to pay attention to what the audience wants. Uh-uh-uh, and I was like, eh, I don't get it. <laughs> so after that, I went to my sister, and my sister's like, you're so embarrassing. You embarrassed yourself in front of everybody. You embarrassed our parents. And I was like, nah, I don't get it. It wasn't until I was really older that my sister was like, oh, do you remember that? And I was like, yeah, but I'm still, I was proud. I don't care. <laughs> Forget that. Are you asking how we feel about hearing children signing songs in ASL? Is that both? Yeah, so both. Okay. So that didn't happen during my time. Nobody signed. In I I elementary, middle school, high school, there were no ASL classes. There were no signing songs. All my, all my friends, all my hearing friends would fingerspell at, at best to communicate with me. People, hearing people then, I don't think thought they could or should or wanted to sign at, at that time. Now you see, it's, it's almost so shocking to me every time that this many people take ASL <laughs> classes. Me and my family are like, really? This many, what's going on? Why are these hearing people? Why all of a sudden? What, what, you know, this, <laughs> why wasn't 30 years ago? Nobody was interested in it 30 years ago, and now all of a sudden everybody's interested, which is good, it's very good. Where were you? <laughs> Where were you 30 years ago? Yeah, I, I can add on to that. Yeah, no, so um, when I was in about first grade, um, so still in a, in a school, not homeschooled. Um, I can't remember all the details of how this went down, but they asked me to do two things. Um, they said that I would hold a sign walking across the stage two or three times. That was like my job in this production, whatever it was. I'm you know, wandering across the stage with a sign. And then they, s they asked me if I would sign a song you know, while they were doing some song performance. And I was like, uh, I don't want to do that. Why would I want to do that? And I knew that my parents weren't going to come. What, are they going to sit and just watch a bunch of hearing people on stage running around? Like, they don't care about that. I mean, so, I mean, they you know, gave me an invitation to give my parents, and I, my parents were like, cool, so there's a thing at your school, whatever. And so I was like, ah, no, what, sure, I'll get up on stage and sign, I guess, because not like my parents are going to be there. But I, I, I knew that my parents wouldn't bring me if I did agree to go. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Yeah, so I told them I'd come. And so that night, I'm like hanging out at home watching TV, and I get to school the next day, and they're like, where were you? You missed it. You were supposed to do the signing song thing. And I'm like, oh, oops. So that was like the closest I got to ever do anything like that. I mean, I, just, I, I didn't really care about that school either, so it was like, I mean, I left after second grade, right? So I mean, it was one of the reasons that I had to leave. I don't know. Anyway, anybody want to add anything else to that, or is there another comment or question related to this topic before we move on? I have a question and a comment. I remember being in school as a first grader, 
and it was do you, everybody was reading independently reading. And I remember sitting there reading a book, and oh, I should say I was in a mainstreamed environment, and I could see that the other kid's mouth was moving, like the, their mouth was moving, and I was like, hmm, okay, maybe my mouth should move. So I'm reading the book, making my mouth move, like the the other student was. I thought that seems fun. Why not? So it's kind of funny. It's the same as Claudia's experience. That yeah, I found myself moving my mouth, and then the teacher said, shh. Um, uh, Tori, you're loud. <laughs> and then I was like, wait, uh, what? I, I couldn't figure out why, w w what the difference was, why what I was doing was different. So I was wondering if um, your experience was the same specifically with reading and um, um, how that you acquired that in your experience with language and reading and signing. <laughs> you were under two minutes. Do you you kept, kept it under two minutes. Well done. Just want to throw that out there. Good role model up here for anybody else that wants to say anything. So how did I learn how to read? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, it happened such a long time ago. Uh, uh, so the process of a teacher's helping me how to decode words, uh, different meanings. Uh, at home, my sister taught me how to read and then sign what was on the pages. Uh, the actual meaning, not signing word for word what we're reading, but the actual meaning. Um, so my sister... At the time, she was in high school. I was in elementary school. My sister was exposed to ASL, and I was exposed to signed exact English. Uh, so my sister would sign an ASL, and I was like, oh, okay, that's what that means. And then I'd look at the words, and I'd sign back to my sister in C. And so we kind of fed each other back and forth. At school, I was in a mainstream classroom. Um, I could voice for myself. And then, you know, if the word wasn't perfect, I'd notice that the speech therapist would come up to me and be like, oh, that's the word we need to work on. And I thought to myself, how does my speech therapist know? Um, so my speech therapist would drill me and drill me and drill me on that word. It was super annoying, but it was to the point in time where words, uh, you know, I'd have to work on CK, 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 and then and they're like, fill in uh, the word, come up with a word that ends with CK. And of course, <laughs> what, I, what word did I make up, right? What word are you thinking of? Yep. <laughs> the speech therapist, don't even try it. <laughs> and I was like, that's the only word I know how to say that in CK. But um, yeah, the reading process, I think, looking back, um, I was lucky. I, I got you know, uh, it at home and at school. Um, in my speech program, the teachers, uh, they were nice enough to understand that. Of course, I wouldn't pronounce things right. I wouldn't say things right. And they didn't make fun of me. My friends did, of course. But, um, but yeah, that's, that was kind of my experience. For me, I think it was elementary school. I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> I did an academy, or there was like an event, uh, let's say, at um, Lafayette where they did speech training, and they trained us, and they trained us, and they trained us, and they trained us. And uh, my family wasn't there. Uh, my sister wasn't there. Um, but there was an event for, for an audience. Um, and it was kind of the same uh, thing. I was signing C. I was kind of trying to voice. And I couldn't really understand. I didn't, the, the light bulb didn't turn on. I, I didn't have an epiphany. I was just trying to voice whatever I possibly could. And then after the event, the speech therapist and all the people in the audience, they're freaking out. Oh, my goodness, it was wonderful. And they put a stamp on a, on a scratch and sniff. I would think it was grape on a, on a certificate and handed it to me. And I was like, great. I just followed what they were saying, what they told me to do. You know, because I was a kid. I just followed whatever they said. And then, you know, my sister, I just followed whatever she did. I, I guess I was a follower. And, and so that's kind of how I learned. Yeah. My older brother... Actually, I would say I think it's pretty similar. So you know y the typical thing of my pa of parents reading at, at the bedtime. That wasn't our family. My brother read to me at bedtime. He would read me stor mythology stories. He was very into. Uh, he's actually a graf gra graphic novelist now, so that makes sense. <laughs> uh, you know, it's flashbacks, of course, of course. But he would have the most creative stories. And and that thank I'm thankful again too that that access to sign was in my family. W my brother s using ASL. My mom would sign and see, and I would fall asleep right away. It was boring, so I didn't want to watch her stories. But when my brother told these amazing stories in ASL, he was like my TV. His stories were so good. So I feel like I I've learned a lot from him. But for speech, uh, that's my my parents really emphasized that. That was something they really drilled into me the the speech. And I could see that if I wasn't doing something right, the look on my parents' face, I could tell right away, okay, that wasn't right. Let me try that again. Let me speak up, enunciate, that kind of thing. 
So uh, it, w it was always back and forth using s uh, speech and sign in our family. And now, specifically my experience with speech therapy, so St. Joseph or is an oral school that uh, is located in St. Louis. Um, it's known for being an oral program. I wasn't a student at that campus, but I went there for speech therapy. I, I remember it being Thursdays. It's like a uh, memory I still, I hated Thursdays. I still think of that, that hatred I had for that speech therapy on Thursdays. My mom dropped me off every Thursday. I don't know if you've ever read stories about some of the traumatic experiences. You know, there's always an old woman covering her face, doing this. <laughs> oh my God, I just spit, see? this. Imagine, you're getting spit on, people are, like it was difficult. And I'm sorry to offend anyone, but this, uh, yes, older people sometimes they have bad breath, I just have to say it. So, um, <laughs> man. Oh, they'd be talking so close to your face. Oh, I just hated it. I hated speech therapy. It was so traumatic for me. And then after I finished the program, I can say that my speech improved. So it's a love-hate thing because my speech did improve, but it was an awful experience. And I'm now married to a hearing woman. And a lot of people say, um, "How do you? H what's your communication with her at home? And uh, a guilty secret, Simcom. And then sometimes if she looks away, I'm thinking she can't she can't see me anymore, and then my partner will say, um, "Don't forget, I can hear you too." <laughs> oh yeah! So when she turns back to look at me, my simcom picks up a little bit more. So I will say I, I do switch back and forth. I use I use my speaking privilege when um, people aren't looking at me to see my ASL. I can call somebody. I can get people's attention. So I, I that is I I do use that. Let me join it and make it unanimous. I did not enjoy my speech therapy either. So none of us liked speech therapy. I really hated it. I hated the, the, them being so close to you. I didn't like it. So I stopped going. I, I forgot what age, but I, I refused to go. So uh, I hated speech therapy, too, because I did have to go to speech therapy. Um, and I'll never forget the first day I went in, and there were deaf kids there. And I was like, yes, we can sign. So it was better than regular school. So I went up to, and I started signing to like the speech therapist or whatever. and. She turns to me and she says, young man, we use our words here. And I'm like, but the, how are these not words? <laughs> I mean, even, even as a kid, I mean, that just threw me, you know? And I mean, it was totally traumatic. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. Uh, yeah, I wanted to add something. I have the same with your brother's story. It's, it's with my sister. Um, so I learned from my sister what she would do. And like I said before, my parents are from uh, Mexico. Uh, my dad's from Guadalajara, and my mom's from Michoacan. And um, they moved here, and I was born in L.A., um, but that's not the point, I guess. Uh, so I would read in school in English, right? Um, and that's why I, I told you guys about the, the story about the sticker. I, I had no motivation, really, to be honest. Uh, I had no desire to go to speech therapy. I remember at night, I, I couldn't sleep, and I'd tell my sister to come tell me a story, and uh, my sister would say, fine. And she would tell me a story from, the story's from, uh, what is it, Telemundo? Do you guys, you know? <laughs> my mom would watch Telemundo, uh, the, the like Spanish uh, TV news channel. Like soap operas? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, soap operas. There you go. Mexican soap operas. That's, she would watch them. And then my sister would, like, memorize the story. And at night, I'd be like, tell me what happened. Wha tell me the gossip. And she'd be like, there was a man and a woman. And they came up to each other. And they were kissing. And there was some passion. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and then one of them convinced the other one, and she was beautiful, and she had a, a I just was fascinated by the story. <laughs> I was fascinated by the story. And, and so that's, uh, I just wanted to share that, uh, the story of my sister and, and the way that she told stories for us. I'm pretty sure we need to meet your sister now. <laughs> you should, We're, you really, really should. We really need to thank her, yeah. yeah. She would have come tonight, but she's. And I never did learn how to read, just to catch you up on my end of that <laughs> question. I just realized I should make, uh, clarify that, again, that we all have siblings who are deaf, which is an interesting experience, because usually when you're growing up, uh, other deaf s students would say, you're so lucky to have a deaf brother or sister. You're so lucky you have that. You don't take it for granted. And I'm realizing now that we all had signing in our home. But the one thing I will, the one thing that I would say, oh, I wish 
so many more of you had deaf brothers and sisters. I, I feel like, why am I the lucky one? I don't want to be the lucky one. Oh, I mean, I just wish that other deaf people had that same experience. And then also, I think about my extended family and how my brother and my mom and my dad sign, but nobody else does. So I have to rely on my family that does sign to connect me to the rest of the family. So lucky, but still some regret with that. Yeah. So one question I want to make sure that we get to spend some time on. Um, I mean, obviously, you've, you've talked about you know, the idea that your family uh, was where you got your language, your culture, but the idea of being deaf as an identity, right? So like that's not just a single identity. Everyone's identity is layered. So you know, everyone has some components of intersectionality where they have all these different identities. And it's, it's, a, it's a complex topic um, that I know a lot of people are talking about right now. Um, so I have a friend from Mexico who is deaf. Um, and she just went to visit her family for some holiday or other, I don't remember. And she came back and she's telling stories about her family who are all hearing. And she kept saying things like, oh, yeah, so my parents do this. They do that. that oh, that's a thing they do. And it's them. And there was this clear separation using third-person pronouns. It was never our, our family. We do this. And so just the idea that she you know, has this culture, this Mexican culture she comes from, but then she has this deaf culture. And so she has all these different identities. And so I just started thinking about that. I was wondering if you all would kind of share some of your thoughts in that realm. So... I'm a man, I'm Mexican, I'm deaf. <laughs> uh, we all know we have male privilege, uh, I have that. I first saw that when I was growing up. I didn't actually notice it, but it's kind of a reflection that I have. My older sister was never had the chance to go to college. Um, she would didn't have the chance to even leave the home. Uh, she barely made it to community college, and that was it. Um, I graduated high school. Actually, before I graduated high school, my parents encouraged me, where are you going to go to college? And I thought to myself, oh, I'm going to go to CSUN or RIT. And my parents were totally fine with it. And so I went to college. And looking back, I think to myself, ah, um, it's because I'm a man. And in Mexican culture, the women tend to be sheltered. And so they had my sister, you know, stay at home. And they, they said to me, go, go find a job, be independent, go to college. And so, you know, that was my experience. Uh, um, so that's one example of, I guess, the, the male privilege that, I, that I'm lucky to have. Uh, as part of your friends, I've, I've learned about that. Um, uh, as part of a friends group, I, I never really felt like I was shunned uh, in my family, I, speaking Spanish and stuff. Uh, I could go to celebrations. Uh, we could do holidays together. Uh, we went on vacation together. I visit my family in Mexico. Um, they never really, you know, said, oh, you're deaf, you can't communicate. They all t tried. They recognized when I was lost, uh, when I was looking around, and they would come up to me, and they'd have one-on-one -on -one conversations with me, you know, in Spanish, uh, and try and create a good relationship with me. Uh, that's kind of where my Mexican identity comes from. I'm, I'm proud to be Mexican. Um, as a deaf person... I don't think I really recognized it until I was, gosh, after I graduated high school. Um, the place where I work, uh, the place where I, I do physical therapy, like I mentioned before, I, I was at work and, you know, I had the goal of being a physical therapist and I really, you know, I really loved uh, working with uh, the, the, in this hearing environment. But it, it was a lot of times when I, you know, I'd come up with conflict. Uh, I'd be conflicted and I'd, I'd tell my sister and my family, I'd say to them, Look, I keep feeling conflicted. I'm missing out on so many things at work. And, you know, I don't know. The goal of physical therapy, I don't know if I can do it because there's so many barriers and maybe I won't be able to communicate with my patients. And, and all these things floating in my mind. And my parents said to me, look, you're too hard on yourself. And I said to them, well, you know, I'm a signer. I, I remember one time uh, a deaf person came to physical therapy. And, oh, I was through the roof. I was so excited to be able to sign with them. And my boss looked at me, and, and my boss was like, did you finish your paperwork? And I'm like, yeah, I finished the paperwork. I'm done with everything. I just want to chat it up. And I, and I took advantage of that opportunity because, I, uh, you know, I, I see that patient luckily every Wednesday. And, and I have that hour to, to communicate with my patient in my first language. And I, from that, I realized that sign language is, is so important to me. Sign language is what I identify with. It's what's caused me to grow. 
Um, I started volunteering uh, at the former school that I worked with, working with deaf children and seeing their language growth. Uh, and I'm able to, to you know, communicate with them and feel really connected with them. And I know that maybe perhaps they don't have that role model at home who's that deaf adult, um, you know, uh, you know, an older sibling or, or uh, an older parent who's fluent in their language. So that's where I feel like, um, you know, from physical therapy, I, I wanted to make the shift into education to, to make a, a better future for um, deaf people. And that's, that's really where my identity has come from. And, and that lives even till today. I'm still figuring things out. So um, uh, I am also Mexican, yes. Um, and you, you wanted to ask my culture. Uh, yes, I feel like uh, that's my culture. My parents, um, you know, they gesture with me uh, and they use Mexican gestures with me. I grew up uh, with them, you know, not, not wanting to learn ASL. Uh, for them, you know, now that I'm, now that I'm older and older, and, and I understand their facial expressions, I understand their emotions uh, just by looking at them. But growing up, um, did I have an identity as a deaf person? Uh, was I proud to be deaf? No. Sometimes I was angry with myself. Sometimes I was upset that I was deaf. And my sister would say to me, Claudia, you know when you were born as a baby, um, I was hoping that you would be deaf like me. And I yelled at you, and I yelled at you, and I yelled at you, and you were deaf, definitely. I was so excited that you were deaf. She told me that, and I said, uh, I explained it to my mom, and I was like, no. And she was like, no, don't, don't uh, listen to her. And she was heartbroken that I was deaf. Uh, my sister, though, my sister was so excited. Uh, and as I grew, uh, I had, um, you know, like I said, my parents' culture, uh, my deaf culture, and the hearing culture. And I couldn't find my identity. And I struggled. I really did. I grew up with a struggle. I rebelled. I was the black sheep of my family. You know, my sister was the angel. Uh, and her education and her perspective and her experiences, she was delayed. She was delayed, but she was still able to navigate. <clears throat> Maybe because she was older. And, and I saw, you know, how she was doing it. I thought to myself, should I be like her? Uh, should I be like my parents? Or should I be like uh, the hearing people at my school? And I was lost. And I was angry. And I was deaf. And I didn't forgive myself. And I was frustrated, and I went out into the hearing world, and I, I saw all these barriers. And then I finally understood, really, that I was deaf. And I found that my deafness was a gift. And my sister, uh, I figured, you know, she's right. She's happy. You know, if I was hearing, then my sister would be alone. And I get it. I get it more and more and more, the benefits of being deaf. But at the time when I wasn't forgiving myself for being deaf, uh, you know, I was stuck in that world. Um, I know my sister has a lot of uh, health issues. Um, she has thyroid problems. That's why she's up and down and up and down and up and down. And sometimes she can, you know, go off the hinges. And, and sometimes we get uh, communication barriers and sometimes we get angry with each other. And now to this day, I'm still learning. I'm still learning to love myself. And now I'm 39 and I finally get it. But yeah, if you ask me in my 30s, no, I, I would have pretended uh, to, you know, I was married th at the time to a Turkish hearing man who, who, knew, s or who knew a little bit of sign language. Uh, he wasn't fluent in ASL or anything. Um, and in their culture, uh, they had Muslim culture, and I didn't care. I was open. I had no identity, uh, and I just followed. Uh, if somebody brought an identity towards me and, and I thought it was even halfway interesting, I followed it. A and I didn't figure out who I was. I was missing. There was no Claudia. I, w I was open to, you know, anything that I was exposed to, and, and it didn't work out, and I, I moved back here, and I'm still working on uh, figuring out uh, who I am. Um, in one way, I'm deaf, uh, and I'm thankful for, for the work that I do. Uh, I do work, and I had to do work with no uh, interpreter at Amazon. I don't know if you guys, you know, you guys order from Amazon. I'm sure you guys do a ton of ordering from Amazon, and at Amazon, I, I work in the warehouse, and it's not a relaxed environment. It's, it's a get-it-going environment, you know, and they're snapping at us. And I've got to write back and forth because I have to communicate with the supervisor. A and all these things are going on, and you won't believe how frustrating it is. And so after a month, my supervisor decided to hire an interpreter. And with the interpreter, I was able to communicate. It opened doors, and everybody saw me, and they're like, Claudia, you're deaf, but you're amazing. You can do this work, and you really get it. And I'm like, yeah, we're the same. And now I'm starting to understand more and more, you know, my role at work. For me, 
Um, you know, I meditate, I do yoga, I'm, I'm a spiritual person, uh, and I've learned all those things. And, and my number one priority is uh, to forgive myself. I'm deaf, and I was born that way, and that's who I am, and I am forgiven. I thank God for, for my opportunities, for my sister, for my family, and for everything. Um, and I understand their cultures, and I respect their cultures, and for me, I don't have to follow their cultures. I can have my own culture. That was beautiful. I have nothing to add. That was fantastic. <laughs> sorry, I stole your thunder. Sorry. <laughs> that was great. So I identify as a child of an Im ch child of an immigrant, as queer. Excuse me, as a daughter of an immigrant. Oh, okay. So as daughter of an, a daughter of an immigrant, as deaf, as queer, as specifically as lesbian. Those are all of the identities that I carry. So I, I can, I'm trying to figure out in that list what comes first. They all come first. They all come first. They're all at the same time. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, I know we were talking before, Rez, um, yeah, in preparation for this, and something you said stuck with me, and I wanted to kind of extend that to everyone else. Um, and maybe I'll you know, misquote you so you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe what you said was something to the effect of, so a deaf person is born, you know, I don't want to screw up the quote. What, can you just, can you talk, can you, do you know what I'm talking about? It's not my quote, it's somebody else's quote. Oh, who was it? A very good friend of mine, Robert Arnold Augustus. He is the one who uh, actually said the quote. Hearing people are born to live, deaf people are born to explain. <laughs> you never stop. You're constantly explaining. That, yes, that's the one. Yeah, no, that really made me think about my dad. Well, and my mom, too. So always having to go and, you know, explain themselves and, you know, make people understand. It's never a given. Um, so, like, you know, when I would interpret that, I would see the first word, and I'm like, here we go. I know where we're going with this. And I would just be able to go through the whole speech, you know, because he said it had to explain stuff to people all the time. And just that, that idea that you have to repeat yourself and it's a constant battle. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? You feel like you do find yourself re-explaining things to hearing people all the time? I, ref I refuse to explain. <laughs> that works. I don't. Figure it out. I mean, really, watch what other people are doing. When I, when I used to teach, I, I, I haven't been in a classroom in years, but when I used to teach, I would start class. I did not feel that it was my duty to explain my life to my students. If my students were curious about who I was, they could wait a week or two, and you know, eventually maybe I'd mention that I had deaf family or an over older deaf brother, and I saw the students perk up, ooh, something personal, and then I went back to my subject. And then maybe week three or four, I'd say, oh yeah, you know, I, yeah, I did go to a school for the deaf, and all, all the students perk up, there's another little tip. But it, again, it was not, I, hearing professors do not explain their background, their life story, their linguistic, ex linguistic experiences. No, they teach the course that they're there to teach. I got tired of explaining. So I let them figure it out. Google it. <laughs> Google. <laughs> ask a friend. Ask the interpreter. Ask other people. I mean, I mean people are smart enough. People are smart enough. They can, they can observe and they can figure it out. One thing I did growing up, <coughs> I've stopped doing it, but what, what I did growing up was, uh, I would say, sorry, do you mind saying that again? What'd you say? Oh, okay. And then I, I'd be like, sorry, and I'm like, why the hell am I apologizing? You weren't clear. <laughs> say it again. Now I'll just go like this. I'll just make, I'll make awkward eye contact. <laughs> okay, okay. So I feel like, what's the point now? I feel like I don't need to explain myself anymore. And people do know more now. People are more aware. And I find that if I'm explaining, if I explain and I make the mistake again, who's responsible? Is it that I didn't explain well enough? Did they not listen weird? It just establishes a weird dynamic. If, you know, people make mistakes. They make a mistake, I make a mistake. So I, I, I think people figure it out fast. I don't have a time to teach a, a course in, in explaining deaf life. Your question was about, like, uh, if a baby was born deaf?
Yeah, so when you talk about, um, you know, like offending, you know, the hearing world or, you know, not making mistakes and, I don't know, what do you feel like um, in terms of having to repeat yourself and saying the same thing over and over, you feel like you have a script that you have to go through and then you wait until they, um, you know, until they get it and then they can learn from so you? So, yeah, I've dated hearing guys. Like I said, I was married to a deaf guy from Turkey. Uh, when we got married, I had to teach and teach and teach him sign language. Uh, and he was, you know, he was excited to learn. Um, I really, I really didn't like it when I was signing, and he would uh, miss what I'd say, or he'd understand. But often he would lie. He'd like admit I did lie, and I'm like, "Why did you lie? You mean you didn't understand me? So you think that our relationship isn't worth it if you're just gonna lie to me and pretend like you understand me?" We used to fight about that all the time about our communication issues. I'd have to explain to him what I was feeling over and over again because I wanted him to understand me. I needed him to understand me. You know, I understood his hearing culture. I understood his, I understood his actions. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I totally got him as a person. But as inside, you know, to understand who he was uh, deeply, that was the hardest part. One time I told him if the two of us are going to be together, um, he had ten children. Oh, we thought about having ten, sorry, we thought about having ten children. Uh, we didn't. Uh, so I thought, you know, if our kids, let's say they're deaf. Uh, what do you what do you want to do? And my ex-husband said to me, he said, oh, I'd take them to get a cochlear implant. I'd help them. And I looked at him and I'm like, but what about me? I'm, I'm deaf. W what's wrong with me? And he's like, uh, uh, uh. And I was like, uh, you know, you've learned uh, Muslim culture. You've learned, uh, you know, that Allah means um, that he provides uh, his gifts, uh, your religion, everything about you, your upbringing, your culture, um, says that you shouldn't change who people are as a person. Um, I, and I don't think we should change our children. And he's like, oh, uh, well, no. A and he oppressed me because I was deaf. And he said to me, um, because, uh, you know, uh, our, chi our child is deaf, uh, I want them to be like me. I want them to be hearing. And I was like, oh, no. So that's one thing that I wanted to share. It was just a bad experience uh, that I had while I was married. Wow, uh, thank you. <laughs> you trying to pick which one, like, what the worst experience is uh, that you can share? I know. I like how, how many can I r rattle off right now? Um, I, wa I was teaching an ASL1 class called Baby Signers. Uh, it was a summer session. And in the summer session, if I remember correctly, it, it, they last about eight weeks. And so they're intense. You, uh, uh, f you know, four weeks, four days a week for a while, and uh, you know, learning so quickly. And that's like seventy-five percent of. I uh, you hear it is seventy-five percent of parents with deaf kids don't sign. And I'm thinking, you could take a summer session, four weeks, four days a week. You would pick up so much vocabulary in just one month that you could communicate with your deaf child. And your deaf child would thrive. Your deaf child would be able to communicate even in a very basic way with their parents and wouldn't have to rely on only a deaf role model from outside the family. So I just wish that there were some kind of um, program really that helped, a financial assistant really that could reach to parents throughout the country that, that ha could have access to have, maybe once you find out you have a deaf child, you get four weeks off and you just go and you learn ASL to be able to really provide that language access, to not expect their children to adapt, to, to try and speech, to try and learn to speak. I mean, it takes years. Why wait that long? Why, why not just take a four-week course, an eight-week course, and, and expose them as much as, as possible? It's a frustration that every time when I teach ASL in those summer sessions, I just wish, oh, I could take this summer session out to every parent and show them. You know, and I, uh, when I'm using my language, my natural language, my storytelling, so sometimes I'll use that with the ASL students a after four weeks, and they're laughing. And I'm thinking, in four weeks, you can laugh at my story. A parent in four weeks can learn enough sign to tell a story to their child. And that's sometimes my biggest frustration when I'm looking at this group of ASL learners. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I hate to say this, but it looks like we've run out of time. Yep, that face. That, that's the face. I know. Can't it believe so it. was so fast. Holy cow. I know. I know. So I just wanted to thank all of you. Thank you so much. Rez, Claudia, Moy, Carol, thank you so much. 
Um, so I did want to wrap up with one, one final thing. Um, now I did used to interpret. I worked as an interpreter. I went into a job one day, and um, it was a little bit early. And so I thought I had, had some time. Uh, I ran to the bathroom. And uh, there was just the one stall in the bathroom. And I thought, well, that's fine. I just need the one. So I went in and closed the door. And then I saw that there was not a lock on this stall. And I thought, well, that's, that's probably fine. Uh, so I you know, went in and got comfy. And um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Let me just <laughs> So, so Kiva just said, so I just did the whole, like, I sat down, and I kind of wiggled a little bit, and Kiva said, I got comfy. <laughs> so <laughs> ex excellent word choice. Thank, thank you, actually, out of all the interpreters. Thank you, all the interpreters, our CDI up front, three at the table. Um, that was awesome. Okay, so, so I sat down, and, <laughs> and I, heard, I heard the bathroom door open, and I heard somebody walking in. I thought, well, they, some, th that guy needs to know I'm in this stall. <laughs> and I'm, I'm short. There's no way I'm going to be able to reach the door with my foot. So I thought, well, I know what to do. That's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> Pray that would take care of it. But no, the footsteps kept coming. <laughs> <laughs> and the footsteps kept coming. I see a hand come over the stall door. <laughs> The door opened. I was like, Dad? <laughs> he said, Red, bitch. <laughs> no, but thank, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. It's such a good time with you all tonight. Take care.